from the heart of rural France. This is the Keto Woman podcast, brought to you by me. Hello, Keto lovelies. I'm Daisy Brackenhall, and I've spent most of my life struggling with my weight and confidence, and I've always had a difficult relationship with food. Even when I finally got to my target weight, after weight loss surgery and eating low carb, I couldn't maintain it and I was miserable. I've been keto now for over two years and it has given me the freedom to fall in love with food again without the constant gain, loss, guilt, virtue cycle of before. Health and happiness is where it's at now, running on fat. Welcome to the Keto Woman podcast. Each week I'll be chatting to inspirational women maybe even the odd man, to discover the secrets to their success so that I can share them with you. So what is keto? Keto is a way of eating that enables you to switch your body's main fuel source from sugar to fat. Who doesn't want to be a fat burner, right? But how do we achieve this? A great place to start is by keeping carbs under 20 grams a day. So things like leafy greens and above ground vegetables, plus some nuts and seeds and the incidental carbs you find in things like full fat dairy. Choose delicious fatty proteins and be free and easy with oily dressings on salad and butter on your veggies. Once you're in the swing of things, you can tweak it to suit you. Make your own personalised keto. You'll hear all sorts of ways to keto from my guests. There is no one way to do keto, no one size fits all. I hope to show you just how flexible and fabulous this way of eating can be. I'm not a doctor and most of my guests won't be either, so we really can't give you medical advice. It's always best to consult your own doctor when making big changes to your diet and lifestyle because they know you and your medical history and so have access to the bigger picture. Wouldn't it be helpful to have one place where you could find all the links? Want to sign up to my new Patreon-exclusive Facebook group, Daisy's Lovelies? No problem. How about subscribing to my YouTube channel? Please help me notch up my first thousand subscribers by going to links.ketowomanpodcast.com and following the YouTube link. Not following me on Instagram yet? Hit the Instagram button. You get the idea. All the buttons, all the links you need are at links.ketowomanpodcast.com. Welcome to episode number 162, where I'm joined by extraordinary woman Nicola Howard. Nicola is an award-winning coach, author, speaker and educator and has been low carb since 1999. She is on a mission to free people from diet prison, remove the linguistically horrific words weight loss from common usage and her 2020 mission statement is assist the UK to eat itself healthy. Nicola also wants to disrupt the diet industry paradigm and move us away from guilt and shame when it comes to food and our bodies. She is one of the only people working within the diet industry to work on the mental mindset side of body composition management, to break people away from victim mentality and to ensure long-term success. Nicola went all in with a coaching career via low carb in the UK in October 2019, having worked on the business part since 2016. Via her innovative HOPE protocol, she has assisted thousands of people with their body composition goals via her website, books, courses and one-to-one client work. She has also written three books based around living a low-carb life from the UK angle and she is planning a fourth book in 2021 called How to Tame Type 2 Diabetes. It's always fun to chat with a fellow Brit, but this time it was with someone who even grew up almost just round the corner from me. And it won't be long before I am just down the road again. Well, quite a long road, all the way down to the seaside, but you get the idea. I hope you enjoy this week's episode. Welcome, Nicola, to the Keto Woman podcast. How are you doing today? I do well, thank you. Life is good. People might hear that we we sound a little bit similar. (laughs) I think we come from the same part of the country. As we engaged, we discovered we live 
we used to live, what, seven miles away from each other when we were growing up? Not far at all. So, yeah, no wonder we sound like each other. That's right. I always like having Brits on because it's that feeling of home. But then when you have somebody who's from your part of the country as well, mm. <laughs> you can you can always spot a local accent. It always feels like <laughs> home, the southeast accent to me. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Now, although I was, when I was younger, accused of being posh quite a lot because I... I didn't sound like other people at school. I sounded more like my nan who came from Northern Ireland ah. because I, she brought me up quite a large amount. My mum was busy working. So I had a, a, a little bit of a softer action. I think as I've got older, I've developed my glossal stops more. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little bit of a chameleon as well when it comes to accents. So I tend to pick up a little bit of mm. whichever people I'm speaking to quite often. So it's, it can be quite, I've had people who find it quite difficult to identify exactly where I'm from because I've picked up all sorts from all over. <laughs> I've been accused of being Australian a fair few times and I have no clue why because I don't think I have any Australian twang at all. I suspect it's where I used to work in IT. A lot of women that work in support come from Australia. Ah. So it, it was possibly an assumed thing. That, oh yeah, you cut. No, I'm not. I'm I'm from London, mate. What? No, you're straight. No, I'm really not. I'm <laughs> I'm from London. Oh, okay. <laughs> Either that or watching Neighbours. <laughs> People picked up a lot of the Australianisms, didn't they, from watching yeah. Neighbours when we were kids? Yeah, definitely. Na- neighbours was what you get home from school, and then you watch Neighbours, and then you have tea. That's right. So. Tea is dinner for American listeners. <laughs> well, don't know, sort of, tea is that sort of in-between meal. I mean, definitely down south because you've got breakfast, mm. lunch, tea and dinner in the south. Yeah. So tea is that sort of around four-ish little nibble, maybe a little drink, um, so like squash or tea or whatever. And then dinner is the proper proper meal later. Although I quite often still call dinner tea, you know, what's for tea? It, yeah, it depends, doesn't it? And then it gets, it can get very fine in a sort of, oh, yeah. in a local area, then it can get very specific as well. It's I, I find all these differences in meanings, especially between British words and American words. I find it endlessly fascinating and oh, often yeah. highly amusing. <laughs> yes. Well, I went out with a Yorkshire lad when I was what? 20-ish or so. So they had breakfast, dinner, tea and supper. So when I was up there, and everybody calls everybody duck or love, even mm. the blokes. That, but how are you doing, love? What? Okay. Buckingham Shears duck, yeah. Yeah. It's like I was sitting in the pub with, with him and the barman would say, how are you doing, love? Mm. To him. Okay, fine. <laughs> Nuance of stuff is just fascinating. Yeah, no, absolutely. We were talking about my Monday Mindset podcast co-host, Terry and I, well, very similar to what we did, actually, end up talking for <laughs> ages before we finally <laughs> hit the record button. But we were talking about pudding. She was asking me about figgy pudding, Christmas pudding. Oh, okay. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. pudding in America is very different from oh, what yes. Brits call pudding. And then obviously we have the Christmas pudding type of pudding. But I was explaining that also, and this is has to be be I would imagine a regional rather than a universal thing pudding is often just dessert what's for pudding yeah, <laughs> yeah what, what is what is for pudding pudding yeah. is a very non non-specific what you call the sweet thing after you've eaten the savory stuff that's right whereas I know in the states pudding is like this almost what we I think we call it angel delight yeah it seems to depend that sort of whippy stuff in a in a cup it can range from that to almost being like I was talking to her about it she thinks of it as almost like more of a almost like a custody thing so it sort of seems to range from somewhere between what we'd think of I think as yeah like a a whipped sort of angel delight through to a sort of maybe almost like a bit of a runny blancmange. <laughs> so it gets very interesting. It all sounds horrible, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Pudding, not that I eat it anymore because wheat and starch and that whole thing. But if I'm thinking what's for pudding, it's normally a slice of cake or a bit of tart or again, a, a steamed pudding mm. with custard or just jelly and ice cream or stuff like that. It's it's not something that is, it's not a specific gloppy, horrible, sweet, overly sweet thing in a cup. No, thanks. 
That's right. It's funny. I just, I think it's, uh, yeah, like I say, endlessly interesting and amusing. Mm. What you call biscuit, we call scone. (laughs) What you call call cookie, we call a biscuit. You call biscuit. (laughs) They've got vests, we've got waistcoats. Yeah, trousers and pants. Pants is what you put on before you put your trousers on. Um, I don't know, luckily or unluckily, I have have some very lovely American friends. And it's doing the translation for them. Luckily, because I am low carb in the UK, which I'm sure we'll get onto later, mm-hmm. everything I do is in British English, mm. proper English, mm. Queen's English. <laughs> so I don't do, I don't have to do any of the translation of anything. And if an American follows me and they misconstrue me, well, that's almost their fault because they, they've done things with weird, they've done American English, they've done weird things. <laughs> um, so I don't think about the conversions of stuff. But when I, I went on someone else's podcast, who's a, lo- a lovely guy called James, who is in the States, and we were doing as we were going along we were doing the translations which was quite fun <laughs> so yeah yeah no this is what i actually mean because that's what you call it don't you that's right i'm used to a very international audience and have a very international group so i constantly flip back and forth between not only the language but then you get into the whole measurements debacle uh, which which i have to say drives me insane one of these days america will get with the modern world and switch to metric i'm not i i like the the change i like the differences um, but when it comes to imperial versus metric it's just annoying because metric is in tens it's so much easier (laughs) but then the standard international unit definition of one inch is 2.54 centimeters it is now actually metric Mm. Um, they just haven't admitted that yet (laughs) but the fact that us's pints are different to the uk's pints i know fluid ounce is ever so slightly different Um, an imperial cup is different to a us cup is different to a metric cup I mean, I love baking in cups. Cups is is a dead easy concept. It's a really mm. easy way to cook. But they're all different. It's that thing of as long as you're relational and you're using the same cup, That's it right. sort of doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. But it just makes the world an interestingly odd place of weird measurements. And what, what gets me is I, I follow a couple of Brits. For some bizarre reason, I love watching people that turn wood, hit metal, gold pan <laughs> on YouTube. I don't know why. I just love doing it. <laughs> There's a guy over, over now over there in Montana who was from Nor- Norfolk originally. So he has a very, very received British accent. He's very, very posh. And he sort of He's had to give in and start calling it aluminum because he's now in the States. Oh, no. And he hates it because, of course, it's aluminium. But aluminum is actually what the inventor called it. So it's technically correct. Ah, interesting. So you can see him when he says it, he's like dying inside. And when he's, when he's, he's trying to, he's trying to do things in inches because of course he has a predominantly American audience. But you can see his, he's doing it in metric first and then converting it. Mm. Cause of course he's what 20 odd. So his brain is totally metric. Whereas unlike yourself and me, Mm. we've got this odd mix of both in our brains. Where I grew up, I learned everything in school in metric, but we cooked at home in pounds and ounces still. And until very recently, I would still measure myself in stone. I I very recently converted to kilograms because it was a nicer number. Um, (laughs) It is, isn't it? Yeah. (laughs) Oh, yes. Much, much nicer number. Although stones are better than pounds. Pounds is the worst possible thing you can measure yourself (laughs) in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, but it's that whole, I still think about long distance in miles, but I, I can't think of short distances in anything but centimetres. Mm. So it's this really weird set of clashes in my head. Yeah, I'm like that. I Well, I've probably just about trained myself out of miles now because I've been in France for 17 years. Mm. I've had to start thinking more in kilometres. And of course, now moving back to the UK, I'm going to have to train myself back to Because yeah. that's the one thing we've we've held on to miles, of course. We've gone yes. metric, but we haven't, yes, haven't done gone fully metric with the kilometres. Yeah, but it is endlessly frustrating. It's the measurement part that drives me mad because it just feels mm. like it makes everything much more complicated. Because the other thing, of course, is if you're metric, you can easily see percentage in something. Yes. So something that drives me absolutely nuts is the labeling system in the States where they can just list their carb counts per serving and the serving size can be as small as you like. 
So you can effectively hide carbs because if it's less than 0.5 of a gram per serving, they can list it as zero. But of course, that serving can be a teaspoon. Yes. Which is naughty because you, you can't then scale it up. And people think this is a zero carb product. I can scale it up. Whereas pretty well everywhere else in the world, they have to list the 100 gram or 100 milliliter stats as well, yeah. which of course handily also tells you straight away the percentage. Absolutely. You know. And that's actually going into origin story stuff. That's the reason why I started low carb in the UK. That labeling difference. Right. When I, I got given Dr. Atkins book by a colleague at work mm -hmm. when I was 29, 29, 28, 28. And I followed that and I got given the copy that had chapter eight in it, which talked about how you do the labeling and, and total carbs versus net carbs and all, the, all that weird stuff. And so I then wandered into Holland and Barrett, as you do, <laughs> and bought supplies, as you do, and, mm -hmm. and looked at the back packet of the, the Scandinavian bran crisp, because I wanted the crunchy stuff, did the calculation and got minus four carbohydrate. Yeah, what's going on here? Like, <laughs> what's going on? That can't be right. So that's what that led me down the rabbit hole of, oh, our labeling laws are based on the EU. They are completely different to the US laws. If I'm having this problem, I can't be the only person that's having this problem. And because at, at that point in my career and until very recently, I worked in IT, websites were easy for me. Technology doesn't scare me at all. I built a website. I built a website. I started a Yahoo mailing list. And that the reason why is that labeling law difference. Oh, interesting. 20 years later, it's got me to a really, really wonderful place, all because the Americans do stuff differently to us. As an origin story, I find that particularly odd and fascinating. Yes, and nice. You know, it's a grouch about a few things, but mostly I love the difference and I love the mm. international nature, certainly of my group. I have you know, loads of American friends, some of whom I've met, some of whom are... I say just virtual. It's so much more than that, especially oh, yeah. as it's developed through the, this time of COVID. But I love it. I love the differences. I love the nuance. I love the interest and flavor it brings to, to our lives. So overall, yeah. these are all good things. It's just the little things like you mentioned about the differences in. It would be really nice if we could have a standard, uh, okay, accept the fact that they're going to stick with Imperial, we're going to have a metric, but please, can we standardize how much an ounce is? Yes. What size a cup is? <laughs> can we make mm -hmm. that bit universal? <laughs> well, I mean, if you want to go sideways slightly, the Australians, they have a 20 milliliter teaspoon, <laughs> a tablespoon. So the, the US and the UK and the EU and the rest of the world have a 15 milliliter tablespoon. And the Australians have 20. It's not just about the Americans' no, best their little cops. That's right. But one of the other things about being low carb in the UK is because majority of English language recipes, English language, this is what you do, comes from the US because they are that much bigger than us. Because they are that much bigger than us, it gives us wonky context for food. Yeah. Which yeah. is why I then wrote in my book, there's a chapter which has US to UK differences. And I talk about grain fed versus grass fed because, of course, the majority of EU and UK meat is reared in fields with grass because we have hills and we have rain. And whereas in the States, they have them in the desert and they feed them the grain that they grow in Iowa. So if you walk into a butcher over here and ask for grass fed beef, they're going to look at you strange because it, it all is grass fed might be grown finished, but majority of its life it's spent in a field. For and, now. And so, for now. Oh, God, don't, <laughs> don't get me. Yeah, let's not start the whole uh, Brexit Let's not debacle. start the whole <laughs> the, well, the factory food thing and, and the Brexit and the la relaxation <laughs> of the labelling laws by the, the current government. Um, uh, and you've got things like most American recipes are probably half again as sweet as someone who is, has a British palate mm. expects it to be. So one of the things I always say to the, the people in my Facebook group and whenever I'm talking on my page is, well, yeah, if you're following a US recipe, cut the sweetener level of whatever mm. sweetener it is. Cut it sort of at least by a third, if not by a half. I always start. As a start. That's my rule of thumb. Yeah. I start with a half. Yeah. And then I add to taste. Yeah. 
because their food manufacturers have manipulated the universal US bliss point, mm. which is where your tongue goes, oh my God, this is the food of angels and I want to eat lots of it. <laughs> um, because they've manipulated that bliss point upwards sweetness wise, even like bread, normal standard white bread is sweet in the States. It's not over here. It's a very savory thing. And it means that any recipe that they've written is going to be baseline too sweet mm. for someone with a, a UK palate. So it's things like that that got me started. And a lot of people that join my group and watch my stuff or, or read my blogs, the universal response is, you are so refreshing because it's UK information. Mm. I don't try to be. I've had people say to me, oh, yeah, you should like do the States in the mornings and the Australians in the evening. It's like, no, my peeps are in the UK. That's where I am. Mm. So that's and I'm happy with that. Well, we've we've sort of jumped ahead a bit and done what I quite often do, meander down all sorts of different <laughs> tangents because it's just interesting. I go <laughs> I go where the conversation goes. But let's go back to where we usually start. Mm -hmm. And we've sort of skipped that bit is for you to tell us about you and start wherever you like. Okay. So I am Nicola Howard, the UK's leading low carbohydrate nutrition expert. And I started my low carb life back in 1999. As I said, someone at work gave me a copy of Dr. Atkins' New Diet Revolution. And the reason they did that is because I had at that point 52 inch hips. I was knocking on 19 and a half ish stone. Um, I was, my knees hurt. I mean, at, at sort of at 20, I think I was 28 when he gave me the book and 29 when I started because it was the 6th of December 1999 I started, um, which was after my 29th birthday. But I remember being my 29th birthday was cake and champagne and red wine. Well, and it was, there's the picture of me on, on the sofa, absolutely trashed. As I say, I believe I was given the book probably somewhere around early November, sometime around then because I think anyway. And I read the book. And it made total sense. So, of course, before then, I'd been a fat child. I didn't grow out of my baby weight. I, I instead just got a very tire-shaped middle because I am an apple-shaped woman. As, as I hit puberty, I, I didn't develop hips and, and boobs. I developed a big tummy around the middle. Hmm. So I'd done the stand of Weight Watchers. And at that point, they were doing exchanges. So it was low-fat, low-carb, high-protein which it worked okay, but I used to use raisins as my saviour. I saved my two fruit exchanges, which of course I now know is disastrous to, to not take away hunger. It makes more of it. But at that point, and I spent a lot of my 20s being hangry and reactively hyperglycemic and just basically gave up. It's like, well, sod this. I'm going to be fat. I'm, I'm going to buy clothes from Evans that make me look okay. And I'm not going to care about fashion because it's, it's pointless. Nothing fits me right anyway, because I'm an apple. Uh, so I, I got very, very grumpy about the whole thing. But so the, the, the motivation for me to start to get smaller was my knees were hurting and my hips were hurting mm. because I was just carrying physically. And I'm five foot 10, 179 centimeters. So I carry it really well, but it was too much. And a chap at work called Tim, we were talking about this and he'd just done, he'd just started. He said, he lent me a copy of the book. I then would bought my own copy. And because I am a logical scientific bunny, it made utter sense. And as I did it, I started to get smaller and I wasn't hungry anymore. And at that point, lost because I was at that point not, I hadn't done some of the stuff I do now. I lost that sort of, th I think it's three and a half stone quite quickly in the first six sort of six to eight months and then I had my 30th birthday mm. and my 30th birthday was I've been really really good all all the old diet mantra stuff which I now um, do not I, I turn that on its head I've been really good I deserve a treat so we went to Pizza Express and I had a sloppy Giuseppe dough balls ice cream you name it I ate it and I felt horrible <laughs> as you do and from there, it started a stall, gain, stall, gain, stall, gain pattern for the next probably year and a half or so. Whereas I would stay the same for a couple of months, then seven pound would appear and then I'd stay the same again. 
And I was still being low carb, although I look back on it now and going, I really wasn't being. For what I know now about my body, I was not being low carb enough for my body. Mm. And I was also working a night shift. So my cortisol was up the wazoo. I was moving houses, being in stressful relationships, all the things that really just stall you out massively. Throwing everything at it then. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, that, that was an interestingly turbulent time in life. And then in 2003, I went to the doc saying, Doc, I think I've got a thyroid issue because I have a big, a naturally big thyroid. Our, our family genetics on my grandfather's side, on my mother, we have a naturally big thyroid. Mm. It just sits there and, and, and it's big, apparently. I, I don't know. But when I went into the doctor and I said, yeah, I think I've got a th-. He said, yeah, I can see you've got a big thyroid from here. And he's like the other side of the desk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so I got tested. All of my results were picture perfect apparently, although, of course, the thyroid was on the low side of normal because the range is so big, it's everybody is normal, pretty much. Well, and also, did they do a full test? I mean, that's that's usually the problem when it comes to testing thyroid. They just test TSH, which is useless pretty much on its own. So so they did that. And the doc then basically said, well, your, your ESR rate, your erythrocyte sedimentation rate is elevated. So there's obviously something going on. Mm. So he said, let's give it a month and then test you again. And my erythrocyte was still at that point was still raised. He said, right, we need a brain in mind. I'm sending you off to a specialist. I don't actually know why he sent me, but I got seen by a geriatric specialist. No clue why. Who basically told me, apart from being overweight, Miss Howard, you are the picture of health. <laughs> and six months after that, I got a very random letter saying, please, can you come in for a pelvic ultrasound? Okay. I ignored it because quite why would I be getting this letter? It's it's a month after that, the nurse of the geriatric consultant rang me up and said, you didn't come in for your pelvic. I didn't receive the letter. I lied. Um, why would I need that? And she, she didn't really want to tell me why I would need that. And I pushed her and said, look, I'm not going to come in for an investigation. I don't need mm. what's going on. She said, the consultant thinks you might have polycystic ovaries and he wants to check. Uh-huh. Cool. Right. Thank you. No problem. When can we book me in? So we booked me in. I had the ultrasound. I had the pearly ring around my ovaries, standard stuff. And so the, my GP then called me back in and said, well, right, let's get you off to a gynae. And at that point, I had private health insurance with my work. So I said, right, well, I can't be bothered to wait more time. I'll go private with it. This is where life takes a big left turn. I had a, a laparoscopy. And the doc said, I don't believe you have polycystic ovary syndrome because your hormones are picture perfect, I believe because I was a low carb person. Mm -hmm. But you do have endometrial tissue hanging out on your sigmoid colon. So we, I believe you've got endometriosis. So I'm going to give you a medical menopause. And I'm 32 at this point in my life. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So he gave me three months of Zolodex and then two months of Liviol which are the uh, the estrogen replacement to stop my bones falling apart. I Am I allowed to swear on this podcast? Yep. Okay, so I went batshit crazy, literally, <laughs> and I started self-medicating with sugar because that was the only way I could actually get myself through the day without breaking into tears, screaming at people. Mm. It was not a nice three months. Mm. And my, bless his little cottons, the boyfriend I had at that point actually broke up with me just before but then he he was like being a really good mate because we really liked each other. It's just yeah, this relationship's not working. So he supported me through a lot of me crying at him and he was a really good mate and he's still one of my best mates to this day. He's wonderful. I love him. Well, that shows what a good mate he, he oh, is, yeah. doesn't it? I actually got him together with his current wife. So <laughs> technically their son is my fault. Um, <laughs> um, and it, it, it was this whole, I just utterly went loopy. And I, in that first, the first month before the, the, they added the Liviol, I gained a stone. Wow. The next two months, I gained another three stone. Bang. All around my That's stomach. That's really going to improve your mood, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> All around my stomach. Mm. Then sort of that stopped and there was no aftercare at all. Mm. No one has ever asked me about that since in a medical context. It then took a year. I know it was was probably about four months for my period to come back after that finished. And then I bled for nigh on a year solid. Wow. And at that point, you can imagine, I'm not loving my body. 
I'm really not in a great mood. I'm addicted to sugar and potatoes. Potatoes are my kryptonite. Potatoes mm, are—I've never met a potato I don't like. No, <laughs> apart from maybe dauphinoise, the ones that the, you know, the, the ones that they whip and bake. I don't really like them. But in terms of that, was how I got through the day. I just went back to eating stuff that calmed me down mm. and dragged me through the day. And even though at that point I didn't let go of the principle, so I was still eating good protein. I was still making sure I had food quality. I was eating bread and potatoes and and cakes and and just stuff. And that went on for seven years because I couldn't get myself back on the wagon. And I, I, I about two years before I did get myself back on the wagon, to use the terminologies of what I were or was then, I had a, a boyfriend that was a mad keen cyclist. So he got me cycling and my body went, oh, this is really cool stuff. And I got like, I've always been quite muscular anyway. I, because I'm an apple shape, I have very slender arms, very slender muscular legs. Mm -hmm. And they, they, my legs really, really love the cycling. And it's like, yeah, if I can just get myself back to, to that, to the low carb stuff, I know that that will make this even better. That took another year and a half from that, that conscious point. And then he buggered off to Holland, to Amsterdam on a stag weekend. And I, at that point was ready and I got the steak in, I got the cream in, I got the peppers in, I got the broccoli in and I spent that weekend eating nothing but steak and cream sauce with broccoli. And that was sort of the beginning, 2010, that was when I sort of pulled myself back into being properly low carb. And at that point, I then broke up with him about a year later and got myself into a relationship where we loved each other with food. Oh. And it was a completely non-healthy relationship that I don't regret having, but I don't like the choices I made while I was in it, if that mm. makes sense for some of those mm, things. Absolutely, yeah. So again, I was still being low carb, but I was being too, too liberal, like a quarter of a pot of custard for, he's low carb, honest. Stuff like that. I would, I would, I, oh, just two crisp breads with, with half this or whatever. Uh, there was a lot of negotiation that went on because of where I was mentally. Mm. And so when we finally broke up in 20, sort of middle of 2016, and I, I actually was just starting to do proper personal development at that point. So I'd done some coaching stuff at work anyway. And back end of, I think it was the back end of 2015, I would sort of decided, well, yeah, maybe I can help people with this low carb stuff. My day job at that point, we had a very mentorship hierarchy style of, of doing stuff or we were trying to bring it in it was a council so it was still very very hierarchical but they were thinking about empowering the workforce making people think out of the box because of course when you've got no money you have to think out of the box mm. and that then led me to well yeah actually I've always been really good at getting people to answer their own questions to the point of my best mate said to me when I was saying, oh, yeah, I'm going, I'm having some proper coaching training to be a coach. She said, well, what's that? And I said, it's getting someone to answer their own questions. And she said, oh, you're training to be Nikki then. You're training mm -hmm. to be yourself because I've always done it. Mm. And at that point, that was when I started to look at, well, I don't want all this weighing and counting and measuring and stressing and fussing. And the scale really is the worst way of measuring any progress at all. What can I do that's going to help me and help others to have a successful approach? And that's when that the, the birth of what I now call the Hope Protocol was born back in sort of 2015, 2016. And then the, the system I then developed off of that with the nine shifts to a low carb way of eating, the 10 keys to unlock your mind and the three secrets that will guarantee your long term success. They were all sort of set in concrete in 2018 when I wrote my third book. And it was very much getting us away from what I call diet prison. Mm. There's a great fashion at the moment for being keto. It's a state of mind. It's not a way of eating. Mm. Being keto is about worrying about your TDEE, how your macros are, what you, your blood ketones are, what, all this sort of stressing is for me. I see it as it's just re-wallpapering the walls of your diet prison. You're taking that low fat restriction deprivation and whatever, and you're just applying it to a low carb way of life. And then people, oh yeah, keto is not sustainable. Well, yeah, I, I agree with that statement. I don't believe that that being so pernickety and precious is sustainable because you've got this huge cognitive load going on in your mind all the time. What can I eat? Is that okay? Will it fit my macros? Um, uh, uh, but, 
brain explodes. Whereas, so I developed a thing called the OSN scale, which is short for optimal, suboptimal, non-optimal. It's much shorter to type. <laughs> and so we, I use that to grade food nutritionally rather than emotionally. So in my world, there is no, I've been naughty because I've eaten a cake. It's, that's utter rubbish. That keeps us childlike victims. Whereas if I choose to eat a cake, knowing that it is non-optimal, knowing that it will probably give me heartburn, definitely will contribute to my waistline, will make me feel crap for a couple of days. If I knowingly want to eat the cake, I make the choice, I eat the cake and I move on. Mm. And there's no drama, no fuss. I've not failed, I've not mucked up. I've not been naughty or wrong or bad. There's none of that in my world, none of this guilt or shame. And so that's what I really now believe the last sort of the last 20 years have been building up to is utterly disrupting the diet industry paradigm utterly disrupting that culture we have around guilt and shame and just the madness around having to keep track of everything in your life no just eat healthy real food make mostly optimal choices your body will sort it out for you because that's what it does its baseline state is it wants to be healthy it doesn't want to be sick And live your life and enjoy it. Life is supposed to be full of joy and wonderfulness. It's not supposed to be penny pinching, calorie counting, carb obsessing, anything. It's not supposed to be. I mean, animals don't hop on the scales every now and then. They just look at each other and they're all, they're all, they're all healthy. Mm. And that's what we are. We are an animal at the end of the day. We just use these wonderful brains we've got and think we're, we are quote better than that. We're just someone that, that can think a bit more. And I'm definitely a believer in trying to get our minds to control our bodies is always going to end in tears. Your body will always win in a fight against you trying to starve it because the hormones are far stronger than your willpower. Mm. And that's sort of where I am now. I'm preaching that message of just relax and let it go and let your body do what it needs to do, giving it awesome, healthy food that tastes amazing and you're never hungry. Why would you choose anything different? Yeah, I think it's very interesting looking at the evolution of people's approach i find it endlessly fascinating to look at where people started and how they've developed their own personal approach and often how it's ended up influencing everything they do yeah a lot of the stuff i do now because as i say i was talking my, about my story i was i actually back in the 2000s i called myself a loser mm. Because you, lo- I lost weight. So when when I sort of got to this end of, of the journey, it's, well, no, let, let's look at our language. And I've, I've always been a believer, even before my mum always said something to me that stuck, words shape your world. Mm-hmm. And I hadn't actually sort of taken that on board in terms of dieting until, say, 2015, 2016. So now I am all about getting rid of the words weight loss from society. Which is a big, big, I'm not, we're not one for small targets. It's a big task. I was going to say, good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. But using more, because Im- loss, loss has an implied find to the brain. Mm. And it's always sad. When we lose money, we lose our keys and things. We lose people. It's always either slightly annoying or completely hor- horrifically, depressingly yucky. So why are we trying to use this really negative word that's telling our brains can i have it back please at some point why are we using that it's not linguistically helpful so i'm i'm all about getting people in my group we actually have a rule rule 3 which is use empowering language around your journey so ditching ditching dropping getting rid of removing burning melting whatever is comfortable for you as a person something that implies a permanent removal and an act I want this gone. I want to get rid of this. I am dropping it. I am ditching it. I am throwing it away. I do not want it anymore. Because what you tell your mind, your mind will give you. Mm. That sounds both completely wonky, but it's very, very basically true. Your mind is a meaning seeking, problem solving engine. You give it, I want it. I want you to do this mind. Your mind will clonk away and give you how to do it. Well, it will look for those opportunities, won't it? Yeah. That's the thing. It, it just acts as like a bit of a beacon to start recognizing those opportunities that are always there, actually. Yeah, but it gives you how to do something within the lens of how you're thinking. So if you're thinking, well, that's impossible, mm. your mind will immediately go, well, yeah, that's the answer. It's impossible. So it will give you what you put in. Whereas if you if you are thinking about, I want to achieve X, Y, Z, how can I achieve that? Who can I involve? What can I do? 
rather than go, well, I want to achieve that, but it's really difficult, so I won't bother. And that's sort of where, where I come from in language. Anything, anything is possible because if you can think it, you can do it. Mm. Might be hard, might be tricky, might take a long time, but you can do anything that you can imagine. And so I have a very baseline part of, I, I actually say I'm quite sneaky because people come towards me to, for weight loss in quotes, but they actually get their minds changed. They get a very personal, a, a baseline of personal development stuff, which is what the keys are to allow them to analyze. Well, why did you put the weight on in the first place? What was the thing that made you need to gather those resources about yourself? And then what was it about your behaviors in the past that triggered you to keep it? And then how are those behaviors serving you right now? Probably not analyzing those behaviors and then replacing them with better behaviors. And it, it's all very gentle and very sort of baby step personal development stuff. But I, I actually, one of the most lovely quotes I got from someone that read my book, she said, you're the only diet book that's ever made me cry about what's going on for me. Hmm. And it was, it was a very emotional thing of, yeah, it's not just you've given me a set of instructions and told me to get on with it and you don't care. You've shown me a way to live my life that I know will be successful. And you show me that you care that I get that. And that was, that's like one of the really the biggest compliments I get I've ever received about my work. Mm, I can understand that. I agree. I think fundamentally everyone has the answers for any health and wellness issues they might have. They're the ones actually who have the answers. It's just about unlocking it. And I think you mentioned there about where are some of the things you're doing now? How are they serving you? I think that's a very useful question to ask yourself. Mm. Because often, actually, something that you're doing, whether, whether it's something that is actually damaging your health, damaging your physical health, your mental health, there's actually a very good reason why you're doing that and it is serving you in some way mm -hmm. and actually finding out how and why it's serving you is one of the keys to letting it go and getting it out of your way basically absolutely yeah i agree i think it's it's very complicated and it's it's so much more than just giving somebody a diet and it's so mm -hmm. individual oh god yeah because for some people at least for a period of time tracking macros and looking at the data and creating spreadsheets that's what is helpful for them mm. because that appeals to them that appeals to their personality type so that's i think that's something else that's key is actually identifying who you are and what drives you and that steers you towards the best approach because i always say keto it, it's not about you Fitting keto, low carb, you know, whatever dietary approach you want to follow. It's about making it work for you. That's, that's the trick. And it's completely variable and individual. Mm, it's why I created a framework and not a diet. Mm. Because I, I realize I'm a totally logic driven person. I love detail. I love the nitty gritty. Most people are not like me, but by creating the three tenets for life, eat when you're hungry. Don't eat when you're not hungry and make every mouthful as optimal as possible given the circumstances you find yourself in. The OSN scale to allow you to assess, well, how optimal is this food or not? Because, of course, I can't be in your pocket. And, and there is no food list you can look at that is exhaustive at all. It's impossible. Mm. So it gives you the power to make your own choices. It gives you the directions in which to live a life. It gives you a structure by which to treat if something happens, how do I deal with it? Well, do I, I make the choice to, it, it's just picking at a wedding. I'm going to get a set meal. I'll probably pick to eat most of the stuff, but not all of it on the plate. I might have half of the pudding because I choose to. And that's the day and it's done. I've done 10 and 3. I've made it as optimal as I can given the circumstances I was in. And that's the day. It's done. And by giving people that framework, it's interesting in the fact that some people love it. And they, they dive in. Other people freak out because it's not structured enough, because it's not telling them, yeah, you need to eat this for breakfast, this for lunch, this for dinner, this for tea, whatever. Other people just generally settle in and make, make, and then 
find their own footing. And I often say within the group, being low carb, being keto, being whatever, anything that is non calories in, calories out. Calories in, calories out is such a simple thing. It sounds like it should work because it's so simple. And of course, it doesn't work because your body is not a bomb calorimeter. Whereas if you are eating a well constructed for you low carbohydrate plan, that will be completely different to Mavis's completely well-constructed, well-carb plan. Mm. That would be different to David's well-constructed, low-carb plan. That will be different to every, because every body is different. My particular body has to be carnivore for health. I discovered that at the back end of 2018 and went carnivore in January 2019. I did, I did, basically I did all January, <laughs> which is something that the public health commission do. They encourage eating all. I love all good meat anyway. So I, I went proper full on. You can do anything for 30 days and I really love the vegetables, but let's, let's just ditch them out and see what happens. And my body went shrink. Oh, okay. Cause I, I'd been stuck probably at that point about 16 and a half stone for about a year. And for your viewers, I'm still not thin. I never achieved goal. It never happened. But being carnivore, I now think I'm probably going to get there. Mm. But my body doesn't need any carbohydrate to be ditching the fat. I can tolerate vegetables. I've done experimentation. I can tolerate. Unfortunately, I can tolerate dark chocolate. I sort of (laughs) wish I couldn't because then I wouldn't eat it. Um, I cannot tolerate nuts. And I used to eat at least 50 grams of nuts every day. And I used to have this, what looked like a high pregnancy belly and I had gut ache, but I didn't really think about it. I thought, well, I was blaming one of the medications I'm on because I have a back issue. And when I took the nuts out, I felt better. I didn't realize. And then day 32 rolls around and I thought, yeah, I've got that almond cake that I baked back in December. I'd put it in the freezer because I'd only eaten half of it. And within half an hour of me eating that, my stomach was like a drum. I was aching. It's like, yeah, okay. No I more denial. Do, uh, <laughs> yeah. It's the whole, yeah. My, and, and every night, it's like, um, Ivana from Keto Munch sent me birthday treats and she sent me her raw cookies, which are basically almond butter, cocoa butter, stuff squidged together. And so I had a nibble of it to test it for a, a Food Friday Facebook video. Mm-hmm. And as I'm on the video, I've gone, yep, yeah, I can feel that. That's making my stomach ache. Mm. And it, t- it tasted okay and it was all good. And I gave the review and I know I won't eat the rest of it because it's just not worth it. I know that for me, nuts are never going to be part of a lifestyle. Green veg probably will be at some point because I I love broccoli. Broccoli is just lovely. (laughs) Um, But in terms of general day to day, and I eat vegetables socially. So if I'm with my mum, if I'm with my boyfriend, it's just easier not to have the argument with my mum. Okay, yeah, I'm just going to eat the veg, it's fine. But day to day on my own, there is no plant matter in my house. At the moment, I'm using spices and herbs because it's the end of the year and I get bored by now. Whereas in January, I will reset again and I will go back to, if it doesn't come from an animal, it's not going to go in my body. So no wine either. So I'll have dry January because that's my choice. I'll have just meat, fish, eggs, cream, dairy or cream butter and yogurt in January and that'll be that and then I'll again probably start to slightly liberalize as I go through the year again and then I'll tighten it back up and and then I and also because of the way the body works seasonally Mm. I know for me because right now it's autumn the light has got smaller and the body is in a well yeah let's let's make sure we're preserving our stores so we can survive the lean times of winter not that we have them anymore but evolutionarily autumn fall for our American listeners. Autumn is a really, really difficult time for your body to let anything go. Mm. It just doesn't. It doesn't want to. Well, no, it's a survival strategy, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, evolutionarily, that's a bad idea. Mm. So I'm very, very resigned to the fact, acknowledging that fact, that yeah, my scale is almost certainly not going to move again until the middle of January. And that's fine because I'm I'm in this it got me it took me what? 20, 20, 30, 40 years to get fat. It's going to probably take me 10 years to get slender. It's not a big deal. I've got, I've got another, another 50 years or so on the planet. So mm. I've got time. It's cool. No, I think we, we think a lot alike. I'm very much more interested in getting people to think for themselves mm. so that they can, like you say, take any situation and be able to figure out the best choices for them in that situation. Of course, you're not only going up against 
the way some people prefer to behave. But you're also going up against the whole diet industry (laughs) because they rely on people not thinking for themselves. They rely on blame and shame and guilt because that's how they get them to keep coming back and back and back. Otherwise, they would have to work so much harder on getting new customers all the time they rely on repeat custom that's yes. you know that's their stock in trade so it's a big battle a big hurdle to to try and get over but it really is the only long-term solution isn't it that's one of the reasons i created low carb living uk which is that direct diet club competitor mm. and i have a quote bad business model because I want to create empowered, slender, healthy people that don't need to come back. Exactly. <laughs> I believe that that is an ethically correct standpoint. I, agree. I want people to be empowered. I want people to be able to live their life. And if they then hang around to enjoy the group support, enjoy the ethics, and, and want to give me that five ninety nine a week, which is I've modelled the bits of the diet club world that works, and then put my hope protocol on it so that they the people actually get what they want rather than keep failing all the time so if people want to stick around in the community well they're they're, they're very welcome and it's 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 not going to be a problem because one of the things that humans we do best we do best in teams we work in social we are social animals we like being in groups Mm -hmm. where we have people that are the same as us well and that's the bit that's the really effective bit of groups like weight watchers that's the bit that does work There's no arguing with that. Yes. As long as you have a good local group dynamic, of course. I I certainly didn't with the one I went to. They were quite heavy on the the um, shame and guilt so it didn't yeah. it didn't sit well with me. However, I know many people who've had fantastic local weight watcher groups and that's the part of it that has been very very successful for them. Yeah. And it's I I do not truck in guilt and shame. It's so we when when we people in low carb living UK are they measure their what their measurements once a month. And if they want to do their weight, they can. But we don't talk about that. Mm. But that's for themselves. If they want to track that, that's fine. And we do daily KPIs because, of course, I come from the project management world at mm-hmm. work, what I used to do. And that's measuring things like, well, how much did you move today? How much water did you drink today? How optimal was your food? What was the optimality? How much sleep did you get? So things that are much more around your health or what we track. And then, as I say, that those sort of the, the, the bust, hips, waist, leg measurements once a month. And they get to take a selfie so that they can see their, their face change as they go. Mm. The only, I think I saw a really good quote two days ago. The only person you are ever in competition with is yourself yesterday. That's right. Doesn't matter about anyone else. And where people come into the group and they celebrate, oh yeah, this, this month I've, I've managed to ditch 10 centimeters. That's fantastic. Let's all celebrate that. And for the people that aren't there, you are just where you are. Your journey will potentially be what it is. Do not get envious or jealous or whatever. And then we do a lot of like gathering and picking and supporting of people that are going slower because their body is a turtle. Their body is a slow body. My body is a slow body. It is what it is. And you just have to deal, know that every piece of optimal, wonderful nutrition you put in your mouth is making your body healthier, even if the scales aren't telling you that yet. Mm. It's just definitely taking the best bits of what I remember from my Weight Watchers experience, I had a very supportive group leader. Whereas I've heard stories from people that have done Slimming World, it is the group shaming session. People are literally held horribly to, well, you put on whatever. And I had a, a friend who's just about to join Low Carb Living. And she said, yeah, I had a group leader who told me she sort of started doing exercise. She gained two pounds that week. And the group leader told her, oh, yeah, babe, don't exercise because then you'll put weight on. Muscle's what we want Mm. because it's all scale obsessed and because women are supposedly, I actually said it on my my live last night, we're supposed to be these wafy skinny things that have no muscles and are weak and ephemeral and whatever, which is utter rubbish. Because women are not almost entitled by society to have any form of muscle density, we've conflated what scale says with health. That message is utterly rubbish. The whole BMI thing is utterly rubbish. All of that stuff is based on a semi-starved body and it's just not healthy. Mm. I actually did a calculation I posted yesterday on social. My Because I'm 100 kilograms right now, give or take, it makes percentages on my body really, really easy. 
I have 50 kilograms of muscle in my body. I have 38 kilograms of fat in my body. So yeah, those are my percentages. It's easy. The standard, because I I turned 50 last Wednesday, the standard for a lady my age is between 27 and 30% muscle mass. So I've got 20 kilograms of muscle just lying around my body extra. Nice. And if I didn't have that muscle, I'd be an ideal weight. My BMI would be 25 instead of 32.1. But I'd be unhealthy. I'd not be strong. I'd just be there. And I'm not willing to accept that compromise. I'd, I'd rather carry an extra 20 kilograms in, in muscle, thank you, be metabolically healthy and able to, to sustain the fat mass I'm also carrying because the muscle is, is helping me to carry that fat mass around. That fat mass is mostly subcutaneous. It's not a lot visceral because of where I've been low carb. So it's not damaging my body. It's just a bit unsightly right now. And I can deal with that. It's not a problem. I'd much rather have a strong, healthy, resilient body that's not going to get a broken hip, that's not going to get osteoporosis. It's got strong. It's just strong. And that's how women need to be to survive. How what well, the next? If I want to live to 100, which I do, I need that muscle. I need mm. that integrity. I need to be able to sustain that for the next 50 years to be healthy and old, not sick and old. Sick and old is an anathema to me, mm. not doing that. <laughs> and I do think it's changing. I think, you know, we're fortunate in there are more and more highly visible women in particular as, you know, that we're women. Like you say, it's traditionally we've, we're supposed to fit this certain model, but there are more and more strong, powerful women coming to the forefront with their bodies on display. You know, think of somebody like Serena Williams. Oh, yeah. Well, Beautiful. she's somebody to emulate. She's somebody to look up to, somebody to stand and look at in awe. This is something fantastic. This is a good way to be, but she doesn't fit that waif-like no model that but I think that's just becoming passe now and that's good I think I think it depends where you are generationally you're still carrying that baggage of Mm. fat phobia and a way we're supposed to look but as the generations are coming up they're starting to have very different and very positive role models yes well if and if you put look at Serena Williams from a standard lens she's technically obese Mm. because of her weight She has got a BMI, I would guess, probably about the same as me, 30, 31 or so, because she's got muscles, because she's heavy. Mm. And yet you look at her and go, there's no way she is an unhealthy animal in terms of what she can do, her body mechanics. She moves effortlessly, as does her sister. That is the ideal of a healthy human animal. Mm. And so really, this the BMI nonsense annoys me that anyone that has any form of strength for their athleticism is obese by those labels. And it's just ridiculous, Mm. completely meaningless. And yet you've also got the flip side, as you say, that those those models. I remember when I was with the boyfriend, he he had two children and we were in my local cafe just up the road. And because that cafe was built in the 60s, it has a lot of Bakelite. It's very Art Deco. It makes a really nice photography background. Mm. So they rent it out. Mm. And so we're sitting there having our breakfast and there's this film crew filming a lady that just did not look healthy. She's literally skin, literally skin and bone. There was no muscle. And Daisy, bless her little cotton, she's looking at me. Am I supposed to look like that? No, Daisy, that's just, no, do not do that. That's not how you're supposed to look as a woman. And we were talking about it later about well, how they would almost certainly Photoshop her to be even thinner than she was. And there was nothing to this lady at all. She looked pale she literally you could see the bones in her forearms and in her in her upper arm you could see the two you know that i can't remember the name the two bones in your lower arm you could see the divot between them and her clothes were not they were hanging on her she didn't look attractive in what she was to me or, or my partner of course because my partner at that point he liked the larger lady anyway um and it was just this ridiculousness of now we are holding up people like Serena Williams. And yet when they, I can't remember the name of the runner who, I think she's a heptathlete, triathlete, someone. They, they, and they, they gave her a photo shoot because she was the gold medal winner in the, the 2016s. And they photoshopped her muscles to be thinner than they were mm. because she couldn't be muscly in the magazine. Mm. Yeah, that's what's wrong for me. I, you know, we all, but 
particularly women, come in all shapes and sizes. Mm. And it is about health and whether your natural body shape is very thin or a lot heavier. There, there are, There's a sort of a range and a very varied range that is healthy. Mm. And you have to be quite extreme in a lot of ways to go outside of those. But you're right. What you should be judging as healthy is not the external appearance. No. Okay, that potentially plays a very small part in the assessment, but so so marginal, it's all the other things that you're looking at to assess whether somebody's healthy. And that's what's important, how healthy you are, not whether you fit an image of what some film crew or you know magazine decides is what you should look like. It's that the assessment of health is different to how thin you are. And yeah, I've I've met some incredibly slender ladies and slender gentlemen who look, my God, they look so vital and healthy. They're brimming with energy. And I think one of the, the key indications of health is how energetic are you as a person? Because to be healthy is to have energy. And if you're on a diet all the time, which restricts your calories, as, as I think Jason Fung says, when you restrict those calories in, your body, the first thing it does to preserve your health is slow your metabolism down. You move less. You have less vitality. And it is definitely that measure of one of the things I love about being low carb. I have that some of the challenges I suffer. I'm, I'm sort of a spoony. And I don't know if your, your listeners will know what that means, but I have a certain amount of energy to get through the day. And because of low carbing, I have more spoons than I would have done when I did do when I was eating crap, basically, when I was eating what the standard low calorie, low fat, or even just whatever food. I've not heard that term before. So it comes from, I don't know if this is fallacious or whatever, but the story is there was two women in a restaurant and one of them had, I think, fibromyalgia or ME or something like that. And she was trying to explain it to her dining partner who just couldn't get it. So the lady gathered a load of spoons off of the surrounding tables and said, right, these is the things you've got to spend on your day. So you like washing your hair will cost you one spoon. Cooking a meal will cost you three spoons. Getting dressed will cost you a spoon. And you've got 12 spoons for the day. And you then have to decide how to spend your spoons. Oh, I like it. So basically they're energy units. Yeah. It's that whole, the, the spoon was the representation of that story. Mm. But if someone calls themselves a spoonie, it's because they have a limited amount of energy to spend on things in that day. So they have to manage it. Oh, uh, how interesting. It's a another way of saying, yeah, I have to manage my energy. Mm. And by being low carb, I know I have more spoons than I would do if I didn't, because I carry a constant pain. I have a, a back issue that gives me that chronic pain that takes away my energy because you have to, I have to spend energy to fight not being in pain. And I have days where I have what I call it a wet sock day. It feels like I've got a wet sock over my face and I can't do anything. They've got worse as I've hit perimenopause, which is interesting, but they pass very quickly. Whereas when I was eating carbohydrate, I would have that for weeks. Mm. I would literally be having brain fog all the time and I wouldn't be able to function properly. I would like do the bare minimum, drag myself through the day, get to work, do the minimum of support calls, go home, crash out. That would be my day and sleep 14 hours at a weekend, like both days and still wake up on Monday morning feeling like death. Whereas now I get around my period time, I get that for sort of three to four days and it's not as bad as it used to be. And I, I directly attribute that to the fantastic nutrition I choose to eat. Hmm. Well, you learn something new every day. I didn't know about spoonies and now I do. <laughs> <laughs> but I like the logic of it. It appeals to me. Yeah. I'm like you. I'm a, I'm a detail and I'm a logic person. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, you've mentioned a lot about different protocols you have and the different things you do. But how to... Put it in one place or multiple places. Basically, where can people find you and find out more about what you do? People can find me at Low Carb in the UK on social media. That is my handle across all of them. Mm -hmm. My website is lowcarbinthe.uk. I do um, one-to-one services. And as I say, I offer a group program with Low Carb Living UK, which is lowcarbliving.uk. 
I like to keep things simple and easy to find. Well, and people don't need to remember it anyway. It will also be in the show notes. It will all be in the show notes. Absolutely. And yeah, so so generally speaking, I try to make myself as accessible as possible. So I've written three books. I'm on Amazon as well. Just look on look on my name for that. Um, I have a, an e-course if you don't want to talk to me at all. Mm-hmm. I have if you want to talk to me all the time, my premier one-to-one service. And if you want that group support, I've got I, I, I've made it all because my mission for 2020 is as empower the UK to eat itself healthy which when I picked that in January, I didn't realize how important that would be. Mm. I've created these various structures so that I am accessible for anyone with any budget practically. Mm. Yeah, because that's important, isn't it? Yeah. It's uh, it's often plays a big part of the decision when you're getting help. Absolutely. And so I I recognize that. So I brought the, I used to work in IT for 30 years. I went all in on being low carb me about this time last year, a month ago, October. So I brought a lot of the science technical things and structures into my work. Mm. And then it was, yeah, it's time. It's time for me to go all in. It's time for me to really step up and serve people, however I can do that. So I've been doing that with my Facebook group for the last six years anyway, because I started, I, we had a discussion on the Yahoo mailing list. Facebook seems to be where it's at. Shall we move in 2015? And everybody on the, on the list said, yes, we should move. So that's when I moved. That. And so that group has now grown to hovering around 12,000 members. Nice. Sort of dips above and below. As they do. As they do. And of course, a lot of people are talking about problems with Facebook and potentially having to move to other places so who knows what will happen this time next year oh who knows (laughs) so so one of the i know i'm building other structures to make sure that the people that want me can find me Mm. it seems to be important actually at the moment to start doing that yes fantastic well it's been a great pleasure talking to you today nicola we have even more in common than i thought we had before we started chatting It's been a very great personal pleasure as well as being interesting. Fantastic. I look forward to being physically closer in location to you before too long. That'd be nice. We'll have to get to, once we're through this COVID nightmare, Mm. I'm sure there will be opportunities to meet up in person. Oh, definitely. I'm, I'm, I suspect there's going to be one heck of a party when we can finally have one. I know I've, I've got a 50th birthday party to have apart from anything else. So. Yes, I've postponed mine. Mine's happening next year. <laughs> 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 I can't deny the fact that I'm 50 this year. And actually, I'm not I'm not bothered about mm. numbers and age anyway. But I am basically postponing mine till next year. <laughs> you know, I get that. Lots of people tell me when I tell them how old I am, they're shocked. They don't believe I'm as old as I am. Because I, I, again, I believe because I eat stunning nutrition, I don't have wrinkles. I don't look, apart from my grey hair, I don't look like I'm 50. I look to I'm about sort of late 30s, early 40s. Mm. And most people are, as I say, utterly fabergasted. I say, oh, yeah, I'm 50. What? No, you're not 50. You can't be 50. You don't look that at all. Yeah, no, I am. <laughs> Great. Well, perhaps you could leave us in customary fashion with a top tip, please. My top tip is done is better than perfect, which covers, I am a a recovering perfectionist. And I had to learn very fast that to get something done and out there is much better than sitting on it and not doing it ever at all. And there's also a slight sort of spin on that from a guy called Adam Savage, who is a maker on YouTube and did Mythbusters. And he says, perfection is the enemy of done which is the sort of the other way around to that. Mm. Because if you get trapped in your perfectionism, you never get anything done. So done is better than perfect. No, absolutely. It's the whole progress, not perfection, isn't it? Absolutely. That's definitely a mantra that I, well, I have to say it's one that I try to live by. I'm a perfectionist Mm. as well. So actually getting things done is a problem for me too. But yeah, it's something that I I try and work on. (laughs) Progress, not perfection is a big mantra in all of my work because done is better than perfect. Mm. Make one step. Doesn't matter if it's right or wrong. Just make a choice, make it work. That's it. That's right. And doesn't matter how small it is either. I'm a very big believer in small steps. A tiny, tiny step towards your goal is better than no step at all. Absolutely. It doesn't matter how fast you go as long as you keep moving. (laughs) Absolutely. 
Well, thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure. Oh, you're more than what I've really, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for a really lovely conversation. To get the resources and links from this show, please go to ketowomanpodcast.com forward slash episodes. Please share this podcast with as many people as possible by sharing one of my links or just taking a screenshot of an episode that you enjoyed. Reviews really help raise the profile of the podcast, which gets it in front of more people, but also helps me attract a wide variety of guests. So please take a minute to leave a review on whichever podcast app or platform you like to listen on. It doesn't go unnoticed by me, the people who regularly like, share and comment on my posts. Your support really does mean the world to me. Thank you. Are you enjoying this podcast? Help me make more episodes and videos by making a pledge at my Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash keto woman or simply hit the support button on the Keto Woman Podcast website. Don't forget to join in the fun on the Keto Woman Podcast Instagram and Facebook pages and Daisy underscore Keto Woman on Twitter. Are you my next extraordinary woman? Maybe you've got an idea for a show, a topic you would like to hear about. Let me know how I can tickle your earbuds by dropping me a line at daisy at ketowomanpodcast.com. This week's end quote is from Tolstoy. Everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing themselves. I did take a little bit of liberty with changing himself to themselves. Sorry about that, Tolstoy. Bye-bye, keto lovelies.